Leading up to World War II, some U.S. military personnel and government leaders realized the importance of Alaska on the world's stage. General William Mitchell, considered by many to be the father of the U.S. Air Force, in a secret hearing of the House Military Affairs in 1935 stated, I believe in the future he who holds Alaska will hold the world, and I think it is the most strategic place in the world. Five years later, nine months into World War II, and one and a half years before the U.S. entered the war, Governor Ernest Gruning realized the vulnerability of Alaska and pointed out in an interview with Washington, D.C.'s Sunday Star that Alaska at this time is the undefended part of the United States. In early 1941, Major Marvin Muktuk Marston arrived in Alaska and began visiting Army posts in many remote areas. During the coming months, he learned of Japanese reconnaissance in those areas. With growing concern for the welfare of the people of these villages and accurately understanding that no one knew Alaska like the people who had lived in harmony with it for eons, he drafted a plan to utilize their expertise in the protection of Alaska. By June of 1942, spurred on by the bombing of Dutch Harbor and the Aleutians and the subsequent invasion of three other Aleutian islands, Major Marvin R. Marston's plan gained the approval of Governor Gruning and the Alaska Territorial Guard was born. During recruitment trips to seek members for the Guard, Major Marston and those who accompanied him found many who did not know they lived in a territory under the protection of the U.S. government. Notwithstanding this new knowledge, many volunteers signed up on the spot. These Alaska Territorial Guard members realized the importance of the duty they were performing, both for themselves and for the good of their newfound territory. During World War II, the Alaska Territorial Guard was comprised of over 6,000 Alaska Native people from throughout the state who stood ready to protect Alaska. Men, women, and children signed up to join the ranks, some as young as 12 and as old as 80. Stories are told of the accuracy of the marksmanship of these men and women, even elders of 80, hitting targets dead center. In addition to being expert marksmen who worked without pay, these guard members had amazing stamina, didn't require supplies except guns and training, had an astute understanding of the land and its ways, and were ever vigilant across thousands of miles of territory. These qualities were of great significance to the U.S. military. When information was gathered by the Alaska Territorial Guard members, it was taken seriously and passed along the chain of command. When incidents happened, like the Japanese balloon bombs late in the war, searches were conducted across vast acres of land, evidence was secured, and statements taken by Alaska Native Guardsmen, the only ones skilled and equipped to do this challenging work. While the Alaska Territorial Guard only existed for about five years, many of the men went on to officially join the military after World War II finished. What they brought to the Guard as people of the land and what they had learned during their time as Guard members carried them through their military service years and beyond. With the closing of the war and the eventual disbanding of the ATG, Alaska Native leaders such as Frank Paratrovich, Percy Apollock, and others continued to rise up and confront the issue of being treated as less than that had haunted them since the Russians had first reached their shores. With the knowledge that by putting their lives on the line for what had now become their country, their voices became stronger and more self-assured in rightly demanding the government owed them fair and just treatment, and they took their places in the creation and governance of what became the state of Alaska. A legislative proposal aimed at bringing an end to racial discrimination in Alaska that failed in 1943 was soon remedied with the passing of the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1945, 20 years prior to the federal government's Civil Rights Act of 1964. However much progress was made, the fact remains that even now, 75 years later, there is more work to be done. In 2001, the Alaska Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights met to discuss the continuing issue of racism in Alaska. During that meeting, June Degnan, a Yupik resident of Unalakleet, stated, Discrimination is a learned behavior. Discrimination is still rampant and pervasive throughout Alaska today. As recently as this last February, Alaska Native leaders met to discuss this topic during the Native Issues Forum. Representative Tiffany Zolkowski of Bethel had this to say on the subject. 
While we've made progress, there continues to be somewhat of a gap in understanding the role that Alaska Native people have played in this place traditionally since time immemorial. It's really difficult work for tribes and Alaska Native people to continue to educate people, educate policymakers, and those who carry the burden to ensure that Alaskans as a state are taken care of. The hard work and sacrifice of the Alaska Territorial Guard must continue to be built upon as they forged ahead into a new world previously unknown to them and willingly shouldered the burden of protecting their lands from unknown enemies we must forge ahead with one goal to establish true equality for all and shoulder the burden of protecting our future as people united in the brotherhood of man mm -hmm.